And here we are back with the inventory stuff that we have been working on in the past. We took a little bit of a break talking about materials and particles and all that kind of good stuff. But now we're back developing some more on this inventory. We're going to expand a little bit more on some of the concepts and add in some more features uh, that have been requested of me in this more intermediate focused inventory follow up. If you haven't seen the original yet, uh, I highly recommend it. There's a playlist with all of these videos in it that just starts at the first video of the first version of the course, all the way up to and also including a bonus video in which we fix a couple of bugs and replace an entire system to be a little bit more intuitive to actually use. For now, though, we're going to talk a little bit more about item subclasses, because in that previous series, I talked about why we ended up using data assets for our items rather than data tables, as you might see in a lot of other inventory systems. And that is because we can take advantage of the object-oriented approach with data assets, because data assets in and of themselves are classes, meaning that they have parent classes and can have child classes. And that is very, very powerful because our entire inventory system is based on just using the BP underscore item. But as you can see in that series, we already made a BP underscore item weapon. And that has a extra value on it. That being the damage value that we have over here. Something can be a weapon, but the inventory itself doesn't really care about that thing being a weapon. The only thing that the inventory system needs to know is, okay, this is the inventory slot that it exists in, this is the amount of it that we have, this is the image that I need to display, and so on and so forth. So we can just work with normal BP on item references in the entire inventory system, and now everything we build on top of that, all the other item subclasses that we're going to be making, that we're going to be talking about today, will still just slot in perfectly to our existing code. We don't need to update our existing inventory system in order to now expand this and add multiple different types of items. The moment the type of item becomes relevant, we can just cast the reference that we already have to the item and upgrade it to the specific type of item that we need. If that doesn't make sense, don't worry, we'll eventually get through all that. So for now, let's make another couple of subclasses. We already have the weapon subclass, so I think it makes sense to now also uh, make something like the uh, child blueprint class of BP item here, and we'll call this BP item armor. And this will have a float on it as well, and this float will be a defense stats. Now, if you're being very tricky, what you could do is you could probably get away with making one class that is just equipment and using the same flow for both of these and then having two like different branches for offensive and defensive equipment that being weapons and armor i don't think like optimizing to that degree is really all that relevant uh, do make sure that they are exposed though uh, so we just make these two separate branches and then let's make another one we'll make a, a bp item and we'll call this one consumable or something like that that's misspelled as hell isn't it and what this will do is it will have something like health to add uh, which will be obviously a float as well and then the next one will also be a float and we'll call this mana to add and then we'll also have a stemmy to add and now we can simply make a consumable item that when we interact with it, will add a certain amount of health, mana, and stamina to our character. We expose all those, and now we can start actually making items off of these different classes. So we already have in our item assets, we have the item sword, which I believe, yes, is indeed of type BP item weapon. But now let's also make in miscellaneous, we can make a data asset and we can get our item a weapon or armor or consumable or whatever. So let's make an armor and we'll make this one item basic chest plate, something like that. And of course, this will have all of the values. So this will be basic chest plates uh, for the name. Item ID is actually something that we didn't end up using uh, all that much and something that we probably want to set programmatically and not just through this, but we have zero, one. So this would be item ID two. The icon, I don't have an icon for this at the moment, uh, to be fair with you. I have not made one. So it's just going to be this random test texture for now. And for the model, the same thing. I don't really have anything prepared for it, if I'm being 100% real with you. 
So what we'll just do is I will get something that seems like it will work. And that will be this table. <laughs> the value will be 50 gold, max stack size. I will set this to one because it is obviously a tool and we don't want tools to be able to stack. The sword we also have at a max stack size of one. And it will give us two extra defense points. Actually, let's go for three defense points. Let's, let's go a little crazy. And that's really all nice and good. So now we can make another item here again through miscellaneous data assets. Uh, we can look at the consumable and we can make one and we'll call this item health potion. And here we can say you want to add 10 and no mana, no stamina. This will be our health potion. Of course, if we make a mana potion, we can just say, hey, you add 10 mana and no health and so on and so forth. Item ID will be three again. We're not actually using this anywhere, I don't think. Uh, I just implemented this in case we ever need it. There are better ways to assign values for these, to be very honest with you. But for now, this will do. Uh, the texture will be just a prudent mask, I guess. Uh, the model will be, I don't know, the sphere. Uh, the value will be 15 coins and the max stack size will be 16 for these, something like that. So now we have a number of different items of a number of different types. Let's implement something in the potions, because for now, uh, we'll worry about equipment later and how that works. We have that set up now. I want to actually add a little bit of code to the potions. So we can go into the BP item consumable and we can do a couple of things here. We can either make a function on this that gets the player's health and then updates it and everything is done by the item. Or we can make that functionality on the player and the item will just call that for the player. And even then we have uh, a couple of choices. We can make that functionality inside of here or we can make it inside of whatever widget ends up doing that. The way we are going to approach this is with a blueprint interface because what I'm going to do is every single item in our inventory system is going to end up being interactable. So what we'll do is we'll make a blueprint interface here. We'll do that in the blueprints folder. Why not? Uh, we can just do that by coming up here into blueprints and we make a blueprint interface. And we'll call this BPI inventory utils, something like that. Opening that up, we can add a interact function. And for now, that interact function isn't actually going to do all that much. It's going to have a reference to the player though. So we'll make an input for that and we'll give that a type third person character so that we can access that. And then the output, let's do a success output. So that will just be a bool and every single implementation of this will return whether or not the interaction was successful. So. For instance, if we uh, try to like attack with a sword, but we're already doing another animation or whatever, we can return false for this. If we try to like take a potion, but our health is already at full, uh, we can not use up the potion and return false so that we can maybe like use that information for something else in our actual inventory system. So now that we have this set up, uh, this is our first function. I doubtlessly will be adding more to this interface. We can go back into our BP item, uh, the parent one, that is. So we go into our items and then BP item, the very top one. That is the parent to everything else. Going into the class settings, we can say implemented interfaces. We add one that will be our blueprint interface. Apparently, we already had an interaction blueprint interface system. I guess we'll just keep these two separate. We can probably merge them together. It doesn't really matter that much. Uh, but now that we have that implemented, we have this interface thing here uh, and we can say on interact. For the basic item, we don't need to implement this at all because the basic item doesn't need to do anything when we interact with it. But we can come up here into the BP item consumable. And now we also have the interface here for interact. And there we can say player, and then we can run the heal player function on that player. So let's make a heal function on our player, actually, because we probably need to have that. So we can open our third person character here. 
and uh, we can just make a function or we could do it as an event i suppose but let's make it a function uh, and we'll just call this here player and honestly we'll just give this three inputs hp to heal i think i call it health to heal actually in the other thing so let's keep our naming conventions consistent which obviously will be a float and then we'll have a mana to heal you could make three separate functions for this if you preferred i think this is just a little bit more straightforward especially if you have items that heal two of the three stats or all three stats or just do a full heal on everything this makes it easier and more reusable so then we need to give the player some stats and what we could do is we could just give him a, a health value and then also give him a max health value and do that for stamina and for mana as well i don't actually want to do that I want to do this a little bit more optimal from just a management perspective performance wise it doesn't really matter that much but what we're going to do is we'll make a blueprint stock uh, structure and we'll call this bp uh, stats and here what we'll do is in structure the first member will be the current value which of course will be a float and then we'll add another variable uh, to it and that will be the maximum value and I guess we could also like implement a minimum value if we wanted to. But for the most part, the minimum value for all these stats is going to be zero. Just making it as a struct is a tiny bit easier to deal with. So that's the way we're going to be doing. And now our health can be of type BP stats. And we can easily make our mana as well and our stamina as well. So we get our health. We break the stat. We get our current value and our max value. We get our current value plus the amount to heal and then we get the minimum between that and the max value so if the amount we're trying to heal plus our current value is less than our max value we just get the result of that addition if it actually exceeds the maximum value it will just return the max value instead that's a good way to just clamp in one direction because we don't care about the value going under zero because again that's not actually ever going to be relevant so it is a little bit cleaner than using a clamp and we'll kind of just do the same thing with the mana and the stamina. So we'll break. We'll add some addition nodes. We'll get the current value for both of those. And then add the amount to heal. Which actually, a little thing that I figured out while doing the last series is since we're inside a function, there's another reason that functions are really nice. Uh, we can actually just get the health to to heal and the mana to heal and the stamina to heal as local variables. And we don't have all that noodly mess all over the place which is quite nice. And then we just add minimum nodes for all of those. It doesn't really matter if you put them into the top or the bottom pins. Functionality of the minimum node is going to be the same regardless. So now that we have all of that going on, we just need to set these values. So we can just copy over health, mana, and stamina over here real quick. And here we can simply uh, set members in BP stats. And what you can do here is we can uh, just enable which members we want to set. So we don't actually want to change the max value at all. There's no risk of anything being changed here in the max value because we're not going to be accessing that at all. Uh, so we can just say, hey, we want to change the current value in this struct for all of these. Uh, and we can just like pull these down here and hook all of these up easily like that and then just for organizational purposes i like using a sequence for this so first it does this one then it will do that one and then i'll do that one this is effectively the exact same thing as just plugging this into there and then that into there and then that into there this is just a little bit more neat this is just a little bit more organized so now we have the heal player function and we can go back into the bp item consumable into our interaction we already have a reference to the player because whenever we will interact with this in the actual inventory uh, system we'll just supply in a reference to the player we'll get to that in a moment for now though we can simply just pull heal player and we can just get the health to add the mana to add and the stamina to add and just plug those in and it's really a simple as that now there was a little bit of an issue here which is good to cover actually i compiled before adding the success return value which meant that when i go into my uh weapon consumable here it actually implemented it as an event because a blueprint interface function that doesn't have a return value is 
implemented as an event. But now, if we compile this, it's going to scream at me because it's turned from an event into a function. So we need to remove it, compile again, and now it will be here as a function instead with a success value. So uh, we can just like copy this over fairly easily and it will work now and we can say whether or not it was a success. Now, in order to get a success value here, uh, it's actually a little bit more difficult because we now need to also like look at whether or not we changed any of the stats and i don't know that that is necessarily super relevant to what we're doing here because this is supposed to be an inventory series not a general like rpg series <laughs> but just for shits and giggles let's do this so we can make a couple of local variables here and that will be starting health which will make a float starting mana and starting stamina and we'll just set these values at the start here before anything else happens and then at the very end we'll just compare them to the current values of all of these stats and if any of them have changed it will be a success something happened if none of them have changed you clearly just clicked on a potion by accident and we don't want to subtract that potion right so we'll just use the same references here to health mana and stamina and here we can just split the structure pins Alternatively, what we could do is we could, at the start, check whether or not, like, health is already equal to max health and that kind of stuff, but that makes things unnecessarily complicated. This is a lot easier, so we just, like, get our starting values, and then at the very end, we add another pin to this sequence. And what we do is we add in references back to our starting stats and we get our current stats. And now that we have the health and the starting health and the current and starting mana and the current and starting stamina all stacked on top of each other, we can simply check our current health value. Is it not equal to our starting health value? And we can kind of just do that with all three of these values. So uh, we just check, hey, has it changed, right? And then we can just hook that up into a or bool operator here where we can just put in all these into an or. And now if any of these three have changed, the output for this will be true. So then we simply just add a return node here with that as the return value. We'll call this success. And that will be what happens after everything else. It's a little bit of a side tangent that we went on, but I think it is relevant to cover. So in our item consumable, we now have the success output, which we can just straight up put into uh, the return node for the interaction interface function as well. So let's take this world item that we have over here and change the item data assets to a health potion, which is it's a big potion, I'll, I'll tell you that much. It's a little bit bigger than I thought it would be, but these are apparently going to be uh, our health potions. So now we can pick these up and our inventory will have these things which apparently are health potions now we have no way to interact with them yet because our inventory system left click uh, is just moving the item and right click is splitting the stack so we're starting to run slightly out of buttons to interact with and use this potion for now i personally do very much like the left and right click capabilities of moving things around the inventory so there's a couple of ways we can go about changing this number one would be having a separate inventory slot somewhere much like these two things over here which is something like use and when we drop something in there it can try to interact and see what it does i don't personally love that so what we'll end up doing next time is we're going to be making a hot bar something that we can place our items into just like any other inventory, but it will be available during gameplay. And we can highlight an item, and then if we left-click with that item highlighted, that is when we will actually use the potion. So we can't use the potion in our inventory here. This is just storage. When it's in a hotbar is when we'll be able to actually use it. And for the full course, if you're watching this in the future, it should be all up on the YouTube channel already. But if you're watching this shortly after it was uploaded, there will be a link down below in the description to the Patreon where you can find the full course. And a very big thank you to all of my Patreons. You can see them on screen right now. If you want to help out supporting the channel, there's a link down below in the description to the Patreon page. A huge thank you to my Cave Student tier supporters, Earl Monteville Erno, and my cave digger tier supporters, Sergey Thomas, 